So in working our way up to uh, handling the complex root case for a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients, uh, where we end up with a characteristic equation that has roots that are complex, I wanted to just do a very brief complex review, complex number review. So let me just start off by reminding you uh, how we ended up with complex numbers. There were a whole there's a whole category of algebraic equations, particularly quadratic equations, have the problem that you often are stuck having to take the square root of a negative number. And until you do something about that, you are unable to solve a whole bunch of equations. And so what we do is we introduce a new number that extends beyond the real numbers, and we call that number i, and we define it formally to be the square root of minus 1. There is no real number that's the square root of minus 1, but we just say, okay, I'm going to make one up. It's imaginary, and I will call it i. And so once you do that, for starters, you can solve the equation x squared plus 1 equals 0, which you weren't able to solve before. That's the first equation that you can solve very quickly, but you can also solve all quadratic equations. So x squared minus 4x plus 5 equals 0. Before we introduced i, we were stuck. We couldn't solve it. Now we get two roots, 2 plus i and 2 minus i. And when you have a quadratic with real coefficients, like this one, 1, four, one minus 4 and 5, yeah, you can be certain that you're going to end up with uh, two complex numbers that have the form something plus something i and something minus something i. So in a few slides I'll define those two as conjugates of each other, but let's go through a little bit more complex number review before that. Uh, so when we have any con um, quadratic equation, when are we going to end up with these complex uh, solutions? Whenever b squared minus 4ac, which is underneath the square root sign in the quadratic formula, whenever that quantity is negative, our solutions will have the form alpha plus or minus beta i, where alpha and beta are both real numbers, and we just have to introduce that i, square root of minus 1, in order to solve all these equations. So we call alpha the real part. It's a real number, and we call it the real part. And we call beta, which is also a real number, the imaginary part, because it's being multiplied by i. OK, so let's talk about a little bit of arithmetic on complex numbers. <clears throat> So if you take a complex number a plus bi and you add to that c plus B, di, the sum of the two is straightforward. You take the real parts and add them, you get a plus c, and then you add the imaginary parts, bi and di, and you get b plus di. And now we have an imagine the real part of the sum is a plus c, and the imaginary part is b plus d. So when you multiply, things are a little bit more complicated. Because you have to multiply the a by c, the a by di, the bi by c, and the bi by di, we end up with a real part that is ac minus bd, and an imaginary part that is ad plus bc. So that's a little bit more complicated than addition. And dividing is, yet again, even more complicated. Formally, we can write a plus bi divided by c plus B, di, but we don't really have any notion of what that means yet. We're just looking for something that is like dividing by a real number, but we want to do it with a complex number. So how do we go about defining that? Well, really, when you divide by a real number, we, we can say a, a, in, instead of that, we're multiplying by the inverse of what was in the denominator. So what we really want to find is the inverse of c plus di. And to find an inverse, let's... Well, first of all, let's see if you know what this is. So I'll let you read over this question. Or well, maybe I'll read it and let you think. What is the inverse of c plus di written in the usual complex form p plus qi instead of writing it as 1 over? So I'll give you a second to think about that. Come to a conclusion. Step, press stop if you want and think for a long time. So this requires that you remember what the def definition of an inverse is, or maybe you need to know. So. The definition of an inverse, as I'm showing here, is um, the question, uh, what complex number do I have to multiply c plus di by to get 1? Right. So what do I have to multiply 2 by 
to get 1? Well, 1 half. So if I multiply c plus di by c minus di over c squared plus d squared, when I do that product, you'll notice the c's multiply each other to give me a c squared. The di's multiply by each other to give me a minus di, sorry, a d, yeah, a minus d squared i squared, but the minus 1 in front of it and the i squared cancel to give me a c squared plus d squared, and then the complex part cancels out, and so I'm left with 1. So what that means is c minus di all divided by c squared plus d squared is the inverse of c plus di, and I'll call that c minus di is the conjugate, and I'm dividing by the magnitude of the original complex number. So dividing by a complex number looks just like this. You take, instead of dividing by the complex number, you multiply by its inverse. And now the inverse looks a lot more complicated than it did for real numbers, but it has the same notion that when you multiply that by c plus di, you get 1. Now we're multiplying it by a plus bi to figure out what a plus bi divided by c plus di is. And you get quite a mess. This is the full expression. And here's the real part, ac plus bd divided by c squared plus d squared. And the imaginary part is bc minus ad times i, all divided by the magnitude, again, c squared plus d squared. OK, so a couple definitions that I've already used here. A conjugate of a complex number, you just flip the sign in front of the imaginary part. And for the magnitude of an imaginary number, you square the real part and the imaginary part, add them, and take its square root. So thinking very much as a, b is like a vector, it's like the magnitude of a vector. Okay, so I will leave this for another video and uh, end there.